Hi friends, welcome back to our series of sessions on energy conservation aspects of different industrial utilities. Today we shall be discussing about compressed air systems. Air compressors account for significant amount of electricity used in Indian industries. Compressed air is an essential but costly utility and its use must be made wisely. Compressed air is generated from compressors which are largely driven by electricity. If effectively calculated, only 10% of useful energy reaches the end point through compressed air. Thus, there is a vast scope for energy saving through proper understanding of the functions of this utility and avoiding its wastage. This is the typical layout of a compressed air system. We typically call it as a ring main system. We have compressors, let's say we have three, two compressors here, uh, pumping to the air receiver. And then from then it is going to the dryer and then the oil water separator and from then the dry compressed air is fed to the ring main system. And from then onwards, the compressed air, wherever it is required or tapped from different sources for different applications. The applications of compressed air are plenty, such like operation of solenoid valves plunger. It's a typical air inlet port for this and the outlet port. And in the process, it operates the, because of the spring, it operates the solenoid valve plunger, which is a typical application, most common industrially operated application. Then we have the operation of pneumatic cylinders. Like, you know, the forward movement of the air pushes this, and as the air comes out, it comes back. So that's how the pneumatic cylinders are operated to and fro. Then in instrumentation, we have a wide variety of instruments that are being operated using compressed air. Then compressed air is also most commonly used as a pneumatic tool. Once we connect it to this check, and then it can be used as a, for drilling, for screwing, for de-screwing uh, of a typical uh, number of tools uh, where compressed air is used in industries. In olden days, Vast areas of instrumentation, including modulating actuator, etc., were operated using compressed air. But slowly, these are being replaced by electronic or electrical drives, mainly because of their accuracy, repeatability, maintainability, and cost. To see the category of compressors, broadly can be classified as positive displacement compressors and dynamic compressors like centrifugal compressors. So positive displacement compressors, we have a piston cylinder system where the inlet filter, it is air is compressed and then discharged to into a storage tank. And then we have a centrifugal compressors, which is basically axially driven. So air enters at the eye axially and then gets compressed and then driven to the outlet. And uh, this is a centrifugal compressors. Most Commonly used compressors are positive displacement compressors or the reciprocating compressors. Then the, the flow and pressure requirements of a given request the determine the suitability of a particular type of compressors, right? So, so broadly, the compressor types you have a positive displacement type and dynamic, under dynamic, we have centrifugal and axial type. Under positive displacement, we have reciprocating and rotary. Under reciprocating, again, we have single acting compressors, double acting, and diaphragm acting compressors. Under rotary, we have lobe type, liquid ring type, screw type, and vane type. These are all the different compressors that are normally put to use. So if you see the positive reciprocating compressors, which are positive displacement compressors, the compressors which increase the pressure of gas by reducing the volume are called positive displacement compressors. So this is a typical uh, piston arrangement as it is rotating, crankshaft is rotating, the piston is moving up, the inlet air is coming and then it is compressed and sent out to the outer thing. So the reciprocating compressors are most widely used compressors. They operate on the cylinder and piston principle. Their flow 
output remains constant over a wide range of discharge pressures. The capacity is directly proportional to the speed of the prime mover. The output, however, is pulsating since in one cycle, air is allowed to enter in and the other it is compressed and discharged. To make this output smooth, a receiver is invariably used. Reciprocating compressors come in a variety of types such as lubricated and non-lubricated, single or multi-cylinder, water or air-cooled, single or multi-stage reciprocating compressors. Then we have the rotary compressors. Rotary compressors, unlike reciprocating compressors, are given a uniform flow. They are directly coupled to the prime mover and need less starting torque. Their outputs are higher compared to the reciprocating compressors. Mechanically, reciprocating compressors give an imbalance a thrust and vibrations, hence need heavy foundation. On the other hand, rotary compressors need a simple foundation. These compressors can give a discharge up to 10 bar. And air inlet is here and just compressed and then set into the thing. Next one is dynamic compressors. Under dynamic compressors, increase the air velocity, which is then converted to increased pressure at the outlet. They are basically centrifugal compressors and are further divided into radial type and axial flow type. Dynamic compressors operated on similar principles as centrifugal pumps, but one fundamental principle is to be understood. Pumps deal with liquid, which is an incompressible fluid. Hence, if you throttle output, the discharge is reduced. For air, if you throttle output, the pressure goes up because it gets compressed. This is how a centrifugal compressor operates. Hence, these are typically suitable for outputs above 12,000 cubic feet per minute. And this is a typical radial type centrifugal compressors that takes in axially and then gets compressed and delivers it here. And this is an axial uh, flow type and uh, delivers the, it, it acts like a turbine. And if you see the compressor selection chart, they should be selected on the basis of individual requirement but as a general guideline, the table is given here. If the root blower compressor single stage is given and its capacity varies from 100 to 30,000 meter cube per hour, where the pressure is varying from 0.1 to 1 bar. Then under reciprocating, we have single and two stage or multi-stage, which vary from 100 to 12,000 for single stage, 100 to 1,200 for multi-stage where the pressure buildup is 0 0.8 to 12 and 12 to 700 for multi-stage. Under single stage screw compressors, we have 100 to 2,400 meter cube per hour high delivery capacity and the pressure from 0 0.8 to 13 bar. Under two stage, we have 100 to 2,400 again capacity where the pressure varies from 0 0.8 to 24 bar. For centrifugal compressors should be selected when the capacity from 600 to 30,000 meter cube per hour, huge requirement of compre uh, air compressors and for centrifugal compressors are used, where the pressure also varies from 0 0.1 to 450 bar. Then if you see the efficiency of a compressor, basically on the compressor capacity, the capacity of a compressor is the full rated volume flow of gas compared and delivered at conditions of total temperature, total pressure and composition existing at the compressor inlet. It sometimes means actual flow rate rather than rated volume of flow. This is also called as FAD, free air delivery capacity. That is air at atmospheric conditions at any specific location. Because of this, because the altitude, barometer and temperature may vary at different localities and at different times, it follows that this term does not mean air under identical and standard conditions. Then the compressor efficiency, if you see several different measures of compressor efficiency are commonly used, namely volumetric efficiency, adiabatic efficiency, isothermal efficiency, and mechanical efficiency. So these are all the different efficiency terminologies of computer. Let's look into one by one. So before going on to the formula, one must understand that air behaves as per the gas equation. PV is equal to MRT, where P is pressure, V is volume, M is specific mass, 
R is a gas constant and T is absolute temperature. Also, there are many thermodynamic processes like the isothermal, the adiabatic, the polytrophic, etc. Adiabatic and isothermal efficiencies are computed as the isothermal or adiabatic power divided by the actual power consumption. The figure obtained indicates the overall efficiency of the compressor and drive motor. As the air is compressed for isothermal power, its temperature at the outlet tends to increase. If this temperature is accounted, the calculations become complex and hence for simplicity, efficiency is calculated assuming the temperature remains constant. The efficiency is also called isothermal efficiency. So the isothermal power is calculated at P into Q into log R by 36.7. So where P is the absolute intake pressure in kg per square centimeter, Q is the free air delivered in meter cube per hour, and R is the pressure ratio P2 by P1. Since actual power can be measured on the electrical side, the isothermal efficiency is calculated as actual, uh, actual measured input power divided by isothermal power. Normally, manufacturers give the isothermal efficiency. You see the volumetric efficiency, which is defined as pre-air delivered in meter cube per minute divided by compressor displacement. The compressor displacement is given as pi by 4 into d square into L into S into phi into N, where D is the cylinder bore in meters, L is the cylinder stroke in meters, S is the compressor speed in RPM, and phi is 1 for single acting and 2 for double acting cylinders. N is the number of cylinder. For practical purposes, the most effective guide in compressor comparing efficiencies is the specific power consumption, that is kilowatt power per volume flow rate for different compressors. And that's how, that's what we normally take is as a metric. Then the, if you see the compressed air system components, Apart from the compressor proper, there are certain system components in the compressed air system, which also should be understood properly. The most important of these are as air intake filters, intake air filters, which are lying here. They prevent dust from entering the compressor and are normally specified in terms of microns. For example, a five micron filter can prevent dust particles above five micron size whereas cannot stop dust particles lower than 5 microns. Hence, before choosing a filter, it is worthwhile to assess the dust conditions in the surroundings. Then we have interstage coolers. Interstage coolers role is during compression, the temperature of air increases, especially when multi-stage compressors are used. Each stage needs cooling. Hence, coolers are required and they are mostly water-cooled. They need specific attention as per the manufacturer's recommendations. Then we have after coolers. These are used to remove moisture and air dryers used to remove the rest of the moisture which may be left at locations in the pipeline. Then moisture drain taps. We have moisture drain taps are used at the end of piping sections to remove moisture in compressed air. Various types of moisture drain traps are available like manual drain cocks, time-based or automatic drain walls. Then we have the receivers. Air receivers are provided to be storage and soothening vital air output, reducing pressure variations from the compressor. Each of the components mentioned above needs to be well maintained for an overall good network performance of this system as shown in the figure. Then we have efficient operation of compressor. There are a number of issues to be that must be considered right at the stage of project planning and also during operation. This will ensure the efficient operation of the compressor. One important issue is the centralized decompressed house or distribution system. A typical case, so dry air is uh, a typical case would be to explain the situation. In a cement plant, compressed air is required at various places. Apart from this, there is a vehicle 
work, workshop at the mines for the vehicle maintenance. There is no point in running a compressed air pipeline from a centralized compressor house to the mines workshop. It is worth to provide an independent compressor for the mine vehicle work, maintenance workshop. Thus, locating the compressor at the proper location is most important since compressors once located cannot be shifted very easily. Then if you see the cool air intake, statistics show that every 40 degrees centigrade rise in the intake air results in additional 1% power consumption. And cool ambient temperature must be provided as intake air. There should be no heat source like a kiln, furnace, etc. near the compressor house. Similarly, dust-free air intake is most essential for a compressor. The dust accumulated in the filter should be removed regularly and eventually the filters must be replaced. There are manometers or pressure switches which will warn out the differential pressure across the filters so their performance can be watched. Dry air is equally important because moisture in the air can get converted into water during compressor operations and damage compressor parts. The compressor must also be operated within the altitude recommended by the manufacturer else its performance will be affected. Then the cooling water circuit should be properly maintained. As explained above, compression results in a rise in temperature and many compressors require intercoolers. The intercoolers are water cooled. They need to be maintained well, especially the quality and quantity of water should be as per the manufacturer's recommendations. And finally, the optimum pressure settings should be set for load and unload operations. To take an example for a capacity assessment of the compressor, unlike electricity, compressed air is not a continuous flowing of energy. Example, in a plant, if there is no operation of any pneumatic device for one hour, the compressed air supplied will only cater to leakages. If there are no leakages during this time, then the compressor will run without compressing the air. This operation is called unload. During unload operations, the prime mover is running the compressor, but it does not compress the air. Thus, it meets only no load losses. The measurement of timings of load and unload operations and power consumption readings will give an idea about the efficiency of operation. The ideal method of compressor capacity assessment is through a nozzle test wherein a calibrated nozzle is used as a load to vent out the generated compressed air. Flow is assessed based on air temperature, stabilization pressure, and orifice constant. So actual air-free discharge, free air discharge, Q, is P2 minus P1 by P0 into V by T Newton meter cube per minute, where P2 is the final pressure after filling in kg per square centimeter atmosphere, P1 is initial pressure, kg per square centimeter atmosphere after bleeding. P0 is the atmospheric pressure in kg per square centimeter. V is the storage volume in a meter cube, which includes receiver, aftercooler, and delivery piping. T is the time to build up pressure to P2 in minutes. So that's the actual free air discharge uh, we are calculating. So then we have leakage test. If the compressor has prolonged load operations, one can come to the conclusion that there are a lot of leakages. This means apart from the pneumatic devices, there are certain places where air is continuously being drained. The best way is to attend the leakage and find out the reduction in load time. The specific power consumption of a compressor can be calculated based on the following principle. If a compressor capacity of Q in meter cube of free air discharge per minute is being operated, with the following consumption, the specific energy consumption can be worked out like load cycle P1 kilowatt for T1 minutes and unload P2 kilowatt for T2 minutes. Then specific energy consumption is equal to air delivered that is equal to Q into T1 minutes. So energy consumed is P1 into T1 plus P2 into T2 by 60 kilowatt hours. Hence, the specific energy consumption becomes P1 into T1 plus P2 into T2 by 60 into Q into T1 kilowatt hours per meter cubed of full air discharge. Note that the subsequent time taken for load and unload cycles of the compressors. For accuracy, take on and off times 
for eight to 10 cycles continuously. Then calculate total on time and total off time. The system leakage is calculated as percentage leakage is equal to T into 100 by T plus T or system leakage in meter cube per minute is given as Q into capital D by capital T plus T, where Q is actual free air being supplied during trial in cubic meter per minute. And T is the time, capital T is the time on load in minutes and small t is time on unload in minutes. So based on this, we can calculate the percentage of leakage in a compressed air network system. Then if you take an industry example, in the leakage test in a process industry, the following results were obtained. The compressed air compressor capacity is 35 meter cube per minute. Cut-in pressure is at 6.8 kg force per square centimeter. Cut-out pressure is 7.5 kg per square centimeter. Load kilowatt drawn is 188 kilowatt. Unknown unload is 54 kilowatt. Average load time is 1.5 minutes. Average unload time is 10.5 minutes. So if you see the comment on leakage quantity and avoidable loss of power due to air leakages is leakage quantity, if you want to find out in meter cube per minute, then it is 1.5 minutes, which is average load time divided by average load time plus average unload time into 35, that is the compressor capacity, which gives a value of 4.375. Then leakage per day in meter cube per day is equal to 6,300. So that's the leakage per day, meter cube per minute. So if you calculate the specific power for compressed air generation is equal to 188 kilowatt hours, kilowatts, that is load kilowatt drawn divided by total capacity into 60 meter cube per day. That gives 0 0.0895 kilowatt hours per meter cube. So energy lost due to leakage per day is 564 kilowatt hours. So 0 0.0895 into 6,300, it gives us 564 units of energy is lost per day because of compressed air leakage. So this is a typical example how we can understand the importance of compressed air system. Then if you see the factors affecting performance and in efficiency is one of the most important factors affecting efficiency is the lack of general awareness amongst the plant personnel that compressed air is the costliest utility and the prevention of small leakages and misuse can result in great economical benefits. For example, if we take a simple case where a worker uses a compressed air pipe in the plant to fill air into his bicycle tire, normally the pressure required for a bicycle tire is 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 bar. For this, he wastes the compressed air worth 5 rupees. The same job can be done at 50 paise or less outside the plant. The management can also afford free air filling well outside the plant from a roadside shop rather than allowing the utility air to be misused for this purpose. Another case is the wrong application of extensions of existing pipelines. Example, if a new area is being added to the plant, a proper study is not undertaken to revise options on whether to install a dedicated compressor or to extend the existing line. Many a times the existing compressed air pipelines are extended. Then it is found that the pressure is not sufficient. Then the discharge pressure of the compressor is increased and the existing system components fail more frequently due to increased pressure, thus adding the leakages. Hence, proper needs must always be assessed before undertaking such works. Also, proper choice should be exercised between a centralized and decentralized and distributed system. Many a times, compressed air is required for aeration. At such places, blowers can do the job of compressors. Hence, pressure requirements of each application should be done from the point of view of energy savings. Another consideration is pneumatic conveying. In the 70s and 80s, this process was quite popular because it does not involve mechanical maintenance. But now again, the energy costs rising, economic viability is in favor of bucket elevators in place of pneumatic conveyors. Then if you see the load unload versus on-off control, in earlier days, starting and stopping large motors was not easy. They used to create a lot of stress on the motor and starting devices. 
Hence, it was worthwhile to operate compressors with load or unload, where the motor continues to run, but the compressor does not compress air. During these operations, motors will have no load losses, and compared to the cost of stress on the motor and starting devices, this was affordable. But nowadays, excellent electronic devices are available to give a smooth, soft start to motor. This avoids stress on the motor and starts devices. Their cost is much less compared to savings achieved in avoiding no load losses of the motor. So nowadays, most of the compressors are operated with on-off controls rather than load and no load control. So that's all about the compressor air system. So uh, have a good time, hope you have enjoyed and it, we have recollected that compressed air is a very worthwhile option to consider for energy savings.